And suddenly Lauren appears after I pray. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Everybody say good morning to Pastor Lauren Thornycroft. Good morning. So Lauren, when Nor Lauren normally speaks, I don't stand up here and say anything, but, but this, today's a little bit different, and I'll, I'll explain why. And you're going to love what she has to share, because every time Lauren preaches, I look forward to it. Um, <laughs> But she's going to be part of our Gospel Shape series that we've been walking through. But I wanted just to pause before she speaks this morning because there's a significant event that happened for Lauren yesterday that is directly related to what God is doing in her, through her, in, in our church. She actually uh, was officially ordained through our Foursquare denomination yesterday, which is pretty significant. Yeah. So to just kind of give you some understanding, like, well, what, is that, what does that really mean? Because hasn't Lauren been functioning in a pastoral role already? Yes, she has been. But in our denomination, the way things work is that you're given a license when you fulfill certain requirements theologically and in your personal life and understanding kind of the, the structure and functioning of our denomination. And Lauren got that a number of years ago and has been functioning with that license. But there's a secondary kind of more of a spiritual significance, and that is ordination. And ordination is the verification and the confirmation of your gifting and your calling which means that not only our church collectively, but also those in leadership in our denomination see Lauren as somebody that God has called and gifted to do what she's doing. And so that's what ordination is. And so I wanted to mention that today because if I had it my way, we would have done a ceremony here for Lauren in our church, but we do it collectively in our district area for other people as well. There's about 22 people that were ordained. Cool. But I wanted to say something because we are the recipients of the gifting and the calling that Lauren has on her life. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense... God is ordaining her, but we're the benefits of that ordination. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to acknowledge that today. I also want to pray for her and, and also express how grateful we are for Lauren and all she does with our youth and our children and our adults. Everybody in the church is being blessed by her gifting and her calling. So would you extend your hand this way? Let me pray for Lauren this morning. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the gift that you have given us in Lauren. Lord, over the last four and a half years, Lord, we have been so blessed by how you have worked in her, how you have worked through her to touch the lives of people. And Lord, now that she has, has uh, received this confirmation, Lord, and this, this verification of her gifting and calling, I pray, Lord, that beyond what she even does in her own capacity, Lord, that you would give her a new capacity that comes from the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, to accomplish what you've called her to do. And I pray that there would even be an... Um, an ease to what she's experiencing, Lord, that would flow through her to touch the lives of other people around her, Lord Jesus. But Lord, we are so thankful that you love the church and you give gifts and gifts are people. And we are the beneficiary of, of a wonderful one in Lauren. So we thank you for her this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Take it away, Lauren. All right, let's go. <laughs> Woo, this is going to be really fun, just in case you guys are wondering. It's going to be really fun. But this is what I love. So hey, if you just need the encouragement this morning, you are allowed to be vocal. I do serve with children and youth. So if you need to be like, hey, I'm tracking with you. That's what our kids say. I'm tracking with you, Lo. There it is. All right, so we are in a series called The Gospel Shapes. So before that, we started with what is the gospel, and we took a really in-depth look, and you even heard Jackie talk a little bit about allowing that coin to drop, that the idea is a vending machine, and the gospel gets put in, but until it drops in our life, the money doesn't matter in the vending machine. And so we talked about the gospel, and now we're in the gospel shapes. How does the gospel shape every single aspect of our lives? And so today I have the privilege of talking about how does the gospel shape our priorities? So let me just, let's get all on the same page that how we define priorities is like the definition. I'm gonna read it to you. is a thing that is regarded as more important than another. Can we all get on board with that? I stole it from the dictionary, so like we kind of have to. That's the definition. But it's a thing that is regarded as more important than another, okay? So like what are the things that we put first in our life? And so what's really interesting about preaching about our priorities is that it's a bit of like an under the surface conversation. I can't remember, and maybe these are just my friends, but I can't remember the last time somebody looked at me and said, hey, what's your number one priority today? Hey, what's your number one priority in life? Hey, what's your number one priority this month? They might frame it in what's your number one goal, what are you most looking forward to? But often, I don't hear people ask me like, hey, what's your number one priority? Instead, it's very much seen throughout what we do with our life. And you can often take a look at somebody's bank account or their calendar and see where their priorities truly lie. You might say, this is something I choose to prioritize, but my actions are gonna communicate differently. And so here's how I'll explain that. As I'll be vulnerable with you, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I am not a morning person, not by any stretch of the imagination at all. Not even a little bit, not even at all. <laughs> not a morning person, big night person, like to do things at night. I love when the sun goes down. It's just like when I come alive. But I'm a fully grown up person, which means I have adult responsibilities in the morning. So, you know, like I have to do the thing and wake up and stuff. So sometimes, though, 
Night Lauren kind of supersedes morning Lauren. And what begins to happen is at night, I'm like, I am gonna wake up tomorrow and I'm gonna go for a run. And I like to run, so normally it's like a good motivation. And I'm like, I'm gonna wake up early tomorrow and go for a run. So here's how that goes the next morning is typically that first alarm goes off that's so much earlier than it needs to be. And it goes off, and in that like sleepy, dreamy, super warm, underneath my covers cocoon, I'm like, do I really need to go running today? Yeah. Like, do, like do. <sighs> I worked out yesterday. I'm gonna hang out with the youth tonight, and I always run when I'm with the youth. Do I? No. And so my little hand comes up and out of the comforter and onto the snooze button. And I fall asleep for those glorious nine minutes. I don't know about you, but there's something about the nine minute of snooze sleep that's like better than any other sleep I get. And I just am like, and good night again. And so then inevitably nine minutes later, my snooze goes off again. I'm like, well, I already missed nine minutes of my run. I'm not gonna get up and finish it now. That's ridiculous. So out comes my hand. And then I snooze two more times like through the rest of my workout. And you guys are like, I just lost so much respect for you. She doesn't even get up to work out. That's some mornings. Other mornings I'm like, oh, I'm gonna wake up early tomorrow morning and I'm gonna curl my hair. And if you're like, what? Just so you know, for me at least, it takes me longer to curl my hair than it does with anything else. And so I wake up the next morning and I'm like, do I really care about having curly hair today? No, I don't. Out comes my arm there to the snooze button. I snooze it. Or like, do I have to iron this shirt or do I have to do this chore or something this morning? Like night Lauren just loves to convince herself that morning Lauren is gonna get all these things done. But in reality, I almost always snooze until there's this point when it's time to be a grown-up and get out of bed or I'm gonna be late to work. And so what happens is that at no point, though, is there ever a moment when in that sleepy dream state, I'm like, hmm, I'll sacrifice my cup of coffee to snooze one more time. There is never a moment (laughs) where my sleepy dream state is like, yep, we can go without coffee today. It's at that point that I'm like, all right, we're getting out of bed. Here we go. I never, ever, 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 never don't have a cup of coffee in the morning. I actually tried to think about the last time I bring coffee to camp. I bring coffee on vacation. Like I cannot remember the last morning I did not start with a cup of coffee, which would mean that if we're gonna take this kind of under the surface conversation about priorities to the surface, I just kind of summarized for you my morning routine. And so a correct summary then would be that my main priority in the morning is coffee, right? You guys tracking with me? My number one priority in the morning is coffee. I regard it as more important than curly hair, than working out, (laughs) than having a cute outfit. And I am like, that's pretty on brand with who I am. I'm okay with that. If you were to look at me and be like, Lauren, I look at your life, and I would say that number one morning priority is coffee. I'd be like, all right, that's, that's fine with me. That's who I am. But I think that that's the kind of conversation that we need to have when it comes to our priorities in general in our life. We need to start to kind of like summarize who we are in our life and can we have a conversation that we bring to the surface that says, okay, then what is my main priority? Because we might say it's one thing, but our actions would say another. If I communicated to you that my priority in the morning is working out, you guys would all be like, "Mm mm-mm. No, it's not, it's coffee. You snooze through your workout. So sometimes our actions will help communicate to us what truly is in importance and held in priority in our life. So here's the thing is that I think before we dive into how does the gospel shape those things, I think it's important that we talk about some of the excuses that we use to put above the gospel in our life. And so I'm just gonna kind of rattle through a couple of them and then I'm gonna circle back and explain it. Sound good? Fantastic, you guys are so much more verbal than first service. That's fantastic. So whether this is something you do intentionally or unintentionally, I think some of the excuses we use are our own stability is the first one. We often will say like, I'm gonna put my own needs, my own financial stability, my own comfort above the gospel alive in my life. And remember, this is not necessarily intentional. You wouldn't say like, oh, I think money is so much more important than God. But when you look at your life, you would recognize that your actions would speak that that is what's true of your life. That I would prioritize maybe working an extra shift or maybe making sure that my life is as comfortable financially as possible. And sometimes that supersedes the priority of the gospel in my life. Or we might look at ourselves and we might say like, the number one priority over the gospel in my life is my own self. Me, me, me first. And I don't mean that we're selfish in general over every area of our life, but I think sometimes our number one priority becomes me first. I really gotta make sure I carve time out. I work a 40 hour a week job and I, and I tell my coworkers about Jesus, but like at night, it's my me time. So like Jesus would never ask me to like serve people at night. He knows that's my me time. He knows I need my me time. Some of you guys are like, ouch, that's painful, <laughs> okay. Next one. Sometimes I think we put our own safety over the gospel in our life. Jesus has asked us to do something or the gospel is coming alive in our life when we recognize that the action step looks a bit scary and we say, but, but what if? 
but like that looks really dangerous. That seems kind of scary, but like what if? And we start to kind of prioritize based on like, I don't feel necessarily safe, and so I'm gonna prioritize my own safety here above what the Lord has asked me to do. Or I think sometimes even, and this one might sound a little funny, but I'll explain it, is I think sometimes we even choose to prioritize our own sin in our life before the gospel in our life. And what I mean by that is that we look at what we've done in our own life and the sins we've committed and we choose to sideline ourselves from what Jesus is up to, from what it looks like to have the gospel alive in our life by saying, well, you just don't know what I've done. I just, I'm, I'm just gonna sideline myself because you don't know what I've done. And it becomes an excuse to prioritize our own sin over what God has asked us to do in our life. So you're like, cool, why did I come to church today? This is really sad. Here's the deal, it's not that those things are a problem. It's not that money or self-care or a concern for our safety or an awareness of our own sin is wrong. It's simply that it cannot become more important than the gospel alive in our life. It cannot become the thing that we regard as more important than the gospel, than what God has asked us to do, than who God has asked us to be, than leaning into what the gospel is for our life. So you're like, well, give me some hope. What does the gospel say about this? Here's what I love about this, is those excuses that I just kind of rattled off for a moment, they're not new to Jesus. They're not. In fact, if you read this book that's kind of old, kind of, that was a joke, it's not funny, it's fine. (laughs) This book that's kind of old as in the Bible, you recognize that they also struggle with a lot of the same things. They struggled with their own stability as an excuse. They struggled with their own selfishness as an excuse, their own safety, their own sin. And Jesus, while he was on earth, had a lot to say about that. In fact, scripture, beyond just the life of Jesus, had a lot to say about how we should prioritize our life. So what does it look like to confront the excuse of stability before the gospel in our life? What does that look like? We're gonna kind of jump into that. And here's what I'm gonna do for the rest of today. I'm gonna tell some stories from the Bible. I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit. And if you're like, hold up, hold up, hold up. You missed some, de- some details. Like, you can go read it yourself. There's nothing wrong with you opening the Bible and reading it yourself. Um, so in Luke chapter five, we're gonna jump right in. This is a story of a guy named Simon talking with Jesus. And here's what happens. Remember, I'm paraphrasing here. Here's what happens is that Simon is a fisherman by career. It is his job to be a fisherman. And Jesus is on the scene and he actually needs somewhere to preach to this crowd of people. And so he talks with Simon and he jumps in Simon's boat actually and uses it as a stage to communicate to everyone on shore. I just had like a little youth pastor moment. I was like, that's a great use of resource, Jesus. Way to think about the boat as a stage. I read that again this time. I was like, that's, that's pretty cool. He just had like a floating stage. It's beside the point. <laughs> a little insight into my brain, it's fine. So Simon gives Jesus his boat. Remember, he's a career fisherman, and when he's done, Jesus says, hey, Simon, would it, what would happen if you kind of like put your nets to the other side of the boat to try to get some fish? And I'm telling you right now, if I was Simon, I'd be like, this carpenter is trying to tell me how to fish right now? But he says this, he says, master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. And he says this, he says, but because you say so, I will put down my net. So Simon's just like, hey, I just want you to be aware that like I'm a fisherman, it's not my hobby, this is my job. I'm like, we tried to do our job all night long and it didn't work, but like if you say other side of the net, I guess because it's you, Jesus, like we'll do it. So they put their boat out and they put the net on the other side and what do you know? They pull in the hugest haul of fish that they've experienced. In fact, it's so big that they call their other friend's boat over, they're like, hey, come help us out and they begin to sink both boats because so much fish is coming into the net, right? I'm the one on the side that's like, I would have told them to go home, and now they've got two boats full. I would be embarrassed. But Simon's not, and so they pull in these boats, and it's crazy, because then Simon kind of starts to doubt. He's like, Jesus, I don't know that I, like, and he just kind of starts to doubt his relationship with Jesus, and Jesus says to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll fish for people. And in verse 11, it says, so they pulled their boats up on shore. They left everything, and they followed him. Please remember that Simon is a fisherman by career, which means fish equals money. You tracking with me? Fish equals money, it's his career. He fishes to make money. And so at this point in his life, he's just hauled in what is most likely the biggest haul of his life onto shore. And in this moment, he's so consumed and overwhelmed by Jesus and his radicalness in his life that he leaves what is essentially a pile of money on the shore and looks and walks to Jesus. It's almost like he has this like, whoa, Jesus moment that he leaves all of his wealth and this potential for a big haul of money because Jesus is so radical in his life, it actually doesn't matter. It's okay for him to leave it on the shore. Whoa, Jesus, and he follows Jesus. There's another story that we read that comes out of Mark chapter 10. 
that you've heard a lot. This man doesn't have a name, we call him the rich young ruler. And he comes to Jesus and he's really excited to tell Jesus that he's obeyed all the laws. And Jesus says, that's great, that's great, but there's one thing that you lack, and we can read this. He says, uh, it says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. And at this the man's face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. So a lot different than Simon. This is a moment when Jesus encounters a man who's, who's got his prior- priorities out of whack. Whether he has chosen to intentionally or unintentionally, his number one priority is his wealth. And when Jesus says, hey, will you sacrifice this for me? It says he goes away sad because he doesn't know how to walk away from keeping his own stability and his own finances as the number one priority. Look at the difference between these two men. Simon says, okay, I'll leave it and I'll follow you. The rich young ruler, he says, he went away sad. Look at what happens when we choose to prioritize the gospel over finances in our life, is that Jesus doesn't leave Simon. He he takes him with him, he provides for him. But also if this is something that you're like, man, I'm struggling with this. It's hard for me to think about what it would look like if I trusted the entirety of my finances to the Lord. Please don't miss out that it says that Jesus looked at the young ruler and he loved him. That there's not a moment when you are beginning to work through the hard things in your life that Jesus is like, you better figure it out. It says Jesus looked at him and loved him. When we're dealing with figuring out the priorities in our life, it's okay for us to admit that sometimes we want finances to be number one. It's also okay for us to leave it at the shore and to turn and follow Jesus. The second one is how do we confront the excuse of our own self before the gospel alive in our life? In Matthew chapter six, Jesus is talking to people and he starts talking about the fish and the flowers. Have you guys heard this one before? The fish and the lilies. And so he says this, he says, don't worry. Do not worry about what you will wear or what you'll eat. I'm sorry, it's not fish, it's birds. You guys are like, no, I don't know. I'm not tracking with you. (laughs) It's birds. He says, don't worry. Don't I feed the birds? Don't I take care of the lilies? And then he says this to them. He says, are you not much more valuable than they are? Here's what I think happens, whether we do it intentionally or unintentionally. We have these moments where we're like, somebody needs to care about me. I've submitted my life to Christ. He has changed my life, but at some point, somebody needs to pay attention to me. I don't feel feel cared for here. What happens if I let somebody into my house? What happens if I give up my night a week where I get to watch TV and I actually go start serving Jesus? Who's gonna care about me and what I need? Who's gonna put me first if I don't do it myself? And Jesus just so simply says, don't worry. They have food, they have clothes, and are you not much more valuable than they? Here's what I think is really important, is that scripture is really clear in the 10 Commandments that we're supposed to take a Sabbath, a day off where we submit that the Lord is the one who is productive and that we are just his vessel. And a Sabbath is not only leaning into his true deep rest, but it's also reminding ourselves that no matter how productive we are, God's gonna handle it. And so when we start putting our foot down and crossing our arms and saying, who's gonna take care of me? When we start to remember that the commandment is that we should be resting, we recognize that in that commandment, Jesus has already taken care of us. He is already taking care of us. And so if you're feeling that pull that's like, I just feel weary, I just don't know how to do it, how am I? Rest in him. He says in Matthew chapter 11, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let me read it to you in the message version because it just kind of says it a little bit differently. It says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me and watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. If you're someone, when you look at your life and you recognize that maybe your priority is that you've got to put your foot down and take care of yourself, will you trust that Jesus has it covered? He says, come to me, and I will give you rest. Come to me, and I will feed you, and I will clothe you. You don't have to put your foot down. You don't have to stomp around and make sure that me first, when we submit to what the Lord has asked us to do, 
which is to take a Sabbath rest, and we submit to what the Lord has asked us to do by putting the gospel first, he will take care of us, and I know it because scripture says so, and I know it because it's true in my own life. How do we confront our own self as a priority above the gospel is we submit to his true rest. We submit that he takes care of us. The third one is how do we confront the excuse of safety before the gospel in our lives? So in Matthew chapter eight, there's a story about Jesus with all the disciples, and they're going somewhere, they're traveling. Jesus and the disciples, they went places quite frequently. And in this story, they all get on a boat, and they go into the middle of this lake, and it seems that just like almost immediately, Jesus curls up in the boat and falls asleep. Me, right? (laughs) Getting in the boat and falling asleep. Curls up in the boat, falls asleep, and it's like, boom, there's this big storm. I don't know about you guys, I don't remember the last time that you were on a boat, but I'm, a, I'm from the desert, so I get on a boat and there's like a breeze and I'm like, are we okay? Are we good? Was that, was that normal? Is this, is this right? Are these waves too big? Right? Maybe that's just because I'm a desert dweller. Maybe all you California coast people are like, no, it's fine, Lauren. But they get on this boat and it's not just a wave, it's not just a breeze, this storm comes and it's thrashing the boat around and the disciples are freaking out, rightly so, right? They're freaking out and Jesus is asleep and they're like, hey, why are you sleeping? <laughs> Fix it. Help me. Get up. Hello. So they wake him up, and Jesus looks right at him. He says, oh, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? And then he turns to the storm, and he calms the storm. And I think so often that that's a really beautiful picture of what it looks like sometimes when we think about prioritizing Jesus over safety in our life. We're like, I'm going to get in this boat, and he's going to be asleep. He's going to be sleeping. <laughs> Sorry if I just spit on you. That's what you get for sitting in the front row. He's gonna be sleeping. I'm gonna get in the boat, I'm gonna prioritize Jesus, I'm gonna walk right into danger, and he's gonna be sleeping, and he's not gonna wake up, and we get nervous, and we start to say like, what would happen if I got in the boat anyways? Let me just submit to you that at this point, maybe it's deeper than just, I have to have safety over the gospel alive in my life. Maybe it's a little bit more of a trust issue. And actually, the first three things, our stability, our selfishness, and our safety all fall under that root of we actually just don't trust Jesus. If I give my last $20, I am actually not convinced that Jesus is gonna provide for me to eat tomorrow. What if, he, what if I go hungry? That's a legitimate concern. I'm not trying to make light of that. We legitimately start to say, I have to prioritize my own stability over the gospel because what if the food doesn't come? What if I welcome somebody into my own home and my own comfort and they wreak havoc and there's nothing left and I have no money left to fix the things that I need? What happens if I don't put my foot down and prioritize my own self? What if I'm just always tired all the time? I don't trust Jesus to give me the rest that he promises in scripture. What happens if I get on the boat and Jesus doesn't wake up? What happens and what What I would like to propose to you today is that it's quite possible that when you look at the priorities in your life and you start to define what actually takes number one, it's quite possible it takes number one because you don't fully trust that Jesus is who he says he is and that he'll do what he says he's gonna do. Man, have you opened the Bible? Jesus is who he says he is. Jesus will do what he says he'll do. We don't have to worry. Are you not much more valuable than they? Are you not much more valuable than they? And the last one is how do we confront the excuse of the sin before the gospel alive in our life? And that one, again, is a little bit weird because we don't ever love to parade our sin around. We're like, the thing I prioritize most is the thing I've done wrong. That's typically not how we live our life. But I still think that we choose to sideline ourselves because of the things that we've done wrong. So let me tell you a story out of John chapter four. There's a woman at the well. Remember, I'm paraphrasing here, so there's a lot that goes behind this story. But basically, Jesus shouldn't have gone to the well in the first place. He should have gone the other way. Then he gets to the well, and he certainly should not have been talking to the woman, but he does anyways. Right? Are you guys tracking with me? You know that story? He starts talking to the woman, and the woman is like, so are you going to get some water? And Jesus is like, if you knew who I was, you wouldn't be asking about water. She's like, so are you going to get some water? <laughs> She starts to kind of converse with Jesus and basically he says this, he goes, okay, why don't you go and call your husband? And she's like, well, I don't have a husband. And Jesus looks right at her, he goes, that's right, you have five and the man you're sleeping with is not one of them. Oh my gosh, if I was at the well, I'd be like, I'm out, I'm not thirsty anymore. I do not need to drink any more water. Jesus looks right at her. He knows her sin, he calls out her sin. 
And guess what? The story goes that he still chooses to reveal himself to her. He doesn't hide himself from her because of her sin. He still chooses to reveal himself to her. Same for us. That when we're dealing with hard things in our life and the Lord has asked us to do something, he's still gonna reveal himself to us because of our own sin. It's not gonna stop him. He's not gonna sideline us because of our sin. In John chapter eight, there's a woman caught in adultery. Can you imagine being caught in your sin and then being brought in front of a huge group of people to own up for it? Super fun times, right? Super fun times. She's brought in front of the Pharisees and the Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus and so they're like, all right, we got this one. Are you ready for this? Jesus she committed adultery, which we know is a sin. Jesus, the law says we're supposed to stone her. What's going on here? What are we gonna do? Jesus has like the best mic drop in scripture. He's like, all right, which one of you is perfect? You can throw the first stone. <laughs> I just wonder sometimes if Jesus goes home, he was like, that was good. <laughs> Probably not, because he doesn't have like, he's more spiritual. I have a flesh, I'd be like, that was good. <laughs> I would not have thought of that by myself. Throw the first stone if you're perfect, that's great. So the story goes that they all walk away. One by one they all walk away until there's nobody left. And Jesus looks up and starts dialoguing with her and he says, then neither do, not, do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. That in that moment when her sin became the number one priority in her life, whether she could or could not handle it, Jesus said, then neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin that in these moments where we have chosen to sideline ourselves, we have to remember that the gospel that we're prioritizing is actually true for us. That we are saved by the same gospel that we are choosing to prioritize and chase after in our life. Which means freedom from our sin and forgiveness for our sin is for us too. And so if you're sitting here and you're starting to look at what you choose to prioritize in your life and you recognize that you're prioritizing the things you've done wrong, as an excuse to sideline you from the gospel, you have to remember that you get to walk in freedom and you get to walk in forgiveness. And as many times as you sit your butt down on the sideline, he's gonna keep calling you back into the game. He does not sideline us because of the things that we've done wrong. And so it no longer can be an excuse. This has to be a conversation that we bring to the surface. This has to be a conversation that we take from being uh, w under the surface kind of like, what are my priorities? I'm not really sure. And we have to bring it to the surface. So I'm gonna ask the worship team to join us again because I just want us for a minute today before we leave, before we rush back into all the things that are so important in our life, I want us to take a moment and let that sink for a second. What would it look like if you started to verbalize your life? Verbalize the things that you prioritize. What would it look like if you start to take stock and take inventory of those things and verbalize where the gospel falls in that priority. And instead of just readjusting them, what would it look like if you submitted to the Lord and allowed him to rewrite your priorities? To rewrite so that the gospel falls as the number one priority in your life. I'll finish my story from earlier. As I was continuing to look at my morning routine and the idea of how much I love coffee, I'll get really vulnerable with you for a moment and I'll tell you that there are some mornings that I actually reach my hand up and out of my comforter and I snooze through my time with Jesus. I'm not proud of it. It doesn't mean I don't spend time with Jesus for the rest of the day. It just means that there are some days when I don't prioritize it in the morning. But if you were to look at my morning and you were to look at my life and you would take stock and take inventory like we have been, you would look at my life and you would say, well, Lauren, that means that you prioritize coffee over time with Jesus and that is not the kind of person that I wanna be. I took that to heart. That's not a fun thing to hear. I don't think it's always fun when the Lord says, all right, you wanna talk about priorities? Let's talk about how you will always sleep through Bible time, but you will never sleep through coffee time. There's this crushing and pressing, that's why I've asked them to sing that song that we already sung today, about what it looks like when we truly submit ourselves to Jesus, that we look at the deep root of what's going on and we say, this is not the kind of person that I wanna be. So I've chosen to have the Lord rewrite my priorities to keep the gospel above coffee in my life. And you know what? It's monumental. It's monumental what happens when we choose to focus as Jesus as more important than other things in our life. And so I just want you to take a minute and however you're comfortable, if you wanna use the space, if you wanna come up to the front, would you just take a moment 
And whether you actually need to do it verbally or not, would you start to think about what you choose to prioritize in your life? And would you allow the Lord to speak to what it would look like for him to rewrite the gospel back into number one? Jesus, we thank you for your scripture. We thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that you are trustworthy and that no matter what excuse we bring to the table, God, that you are trustworthy enough for us to put you back as number one. God, you are who you say you are. You do what you say you'll do and you will never leave us or forsake us. And so Lord, in this moment, as we just open up our lives to you, God, would you reveal to us what it is that takes that first seat above the gospel alive in our life. And Lord, more than just reveal it, God, would you begin to communicate to our hearts what it looks like to allow you to rewrite our priorities and get them set straight. We love you, Jesus, in your name.